So when we take two objects in this quotient space, say V quotiented by U, I'm not repeating all that I've written like U is a subspace of V and so on and so forth. By now, I expect you to be familiar with that already, okay? So now, when we take two objects in this, what are we talking about? We are talking about two sets. So what we are trying to define is an addition operation between two sets and it must make sense because again, like you've seen, you, you might choose V, your friend might choose V hat and they might both end up with the same uh, object eventually. But when you are adding the same objects, do they actually lead to the same object again? I mean, the way you are defining your addition, if you define two and three as two numbers and you add them, you should get five each time. Your friend might say, let me call X is equal to two and Y is equal to three. So your friend's X plus Y is also equal to five and your two plus three is also equal to five, right? Now, it shouldn't matter by what name you are calling that object or your friend is calling those two objects, their sums must also agree. So that is the consistency of that addition that we have to first be aware of. With that in mind, we will define the addition in this manner. For uh, V1 plus U comma V2 plus U belonging to V quotiented by U. We define this addition V1 plus U. So I'll use a different color because this is not this addition, but actually the addition we are defining. right? That is the definition. And the moment we have defined this, we have to question ourselves if this even makes sense. That is, how do we check that? Suppose you take V1 plus U to be this object. Your friend takes this object to be V1 hat plus U. You take this object to be V2 plus U. Your friend calls this object V2 hat plus U. However, upon adding your version of the objects, that is V1 plus U and V2 plus U, if you have ended up with V1 plus V2 plus U like so, your friend should also end up with the same affine set at the end of the day, which is representable by V1 hat plus V2 hat plus U. Is that clear? Or have I said a lot of things all at one go? We will we'll go slowly. Suppose V1 plus U is equal to V1 hat plus U, quite possible. <clears throat> yeah, we have seen that multiple vectors when adding a bias to the subspace can lead to the same affine set. There is no unique way of representing it. Hmm? And V2 plus U is equal to V2 hat plus U. Now this definition is sacrosanct. We have defined it in this manner. What needs to be checked is that when you are adding fellows on the left hand side of this equality and your friend is adding fellows on the right hand side of the equality, this equality must still carry over. So for you, the sum is V1 plus V2 sorry, V1 plus U, let me carry on using that color for a little while longer, plus V2 plus U is equal to V1 plus V2 plus U. And on the other hand, V1 hat plus U, plus V2 hat plus U is equal to V1 hat plus V2 hat plus U. What we shall be interested in checking is 
do these objects check out do these objects equal one another yeah because if these aren't identical then it turns out that whether you call something by a name that makes a difference right and Shakespeare was wrong there is a lot to a name then right so what do we have to do then yes yeah so everything on this side is defined because this is another new vector <clears throat> yeah you know what this object is it's a set this is another set this is another set so this is the way we are imposing the addition operation we are saying that if you go ahead and cook up a set like so an affine set and another affine set if you add them then all that you need to do is just take the individual bias terms the vectors add them up together that gives you a resultant v and it's equivalent to that resultant bias so we are that yes yes we are defining that addition yeah okay yeah if you like no that that's the reason why i use the color coding here because this addition is just the notation but this addition is basically denoting what you would have wanted in terms of the colon that is the definition yeah <clears throat> all right so the question is are these identical and it turns out that they are but how do we establish that well we will use that result that we've just proved a while back few minutes back so look what does this mean if these two are equal can we not say so observe that v1 minus v2 definitely belongs to u sorry v1 minus v1 hat i'm sorry yeah that's exactly what we have proved if two of those affine sets are equal then the difference between the bias terms must belong to that subspace right and from the second equality we can say v2 minus v2 hat also belongs to you <coughs> excuse me so now if you add these two fellows in u because u is a subspace so it is closed under vector addition therefore v1 minus v1 hat plus v2 minus v2 hat must belong to u correct after all i am taking two objects in u adding them so it must be closed under vector addition but now i am going to rearrange the terms a bit and write v1 plus v2 minus v1 hat plus v2 hat and this obviously rearrangement of term does nothing to change the inclusion of an object in a vector space or not hmm? so this is true but what does this mean if you now call this as some vector p1 and call this as some vector p2 if p1 minus p2 belongs to u then is it not the case that we've just seen earlier that p1 plus u is equal to p2 plus u yeah so let's call this say p1 and call this just you know i don't want to confuse you with too many symbols but p1 plus p2 which means p1 plus u is equal to p2 <coughs> plus u and then plugging back whatever is p1 you have v1 plus v2 plus u is equal to v1 hat plus v2 hat plus u so therefore indeed the resultant that we an, end up with here yeah this object and this object cannot help but be the same right so therefore this addition is well defined even though objects or elements inside this quotient space might have non unique representations you don't really need to meddle with that you don't need really need to bother with that 
go ahead and represent an object inside the quotient in any way that you like. Take any two such objects and carry out this binary operation of vector addition, it is well defined. That is the biggest hurdle towards the construction of a vector space in the form of a quotient. Once you have ensured that it is well defined, it is just a trivial matter to check, although I would insist that you do so, to verify that it is indeed got a structure of a vector space. Of course, we still need to define the scalar multiplication, right? So I'll do that next. So for alpha belonging to the field F, yeah, just define alpha and maybe just carry on with that color. V plus U is just to make you happy, I'm going to put the definition symbol and it's alpha times V. This is remember the usual scalar product in the vector space V. So this I'm not using any color because you already know what this means. Just like this addition you already know is the usual vector addition plus U. And once again, you can go ahead and check that it really matters not if you have described this by V plus U or V hat plus U. Because on the right hand side, you will either have alpha V plus U or alpha V hat plus U. Yeah, and again, by the same token, you can argue because of the closure under scalar multiplication, alpha V minus alpha V hat must belong to U, right? That is exactly the crux of the matter. So again, you need me to prove this? I think you can just go ahead and verify that this, yes? Oh, that's what we have just proved, you see. This is P1, this is P2. So whenever P1 minus P2 belongs to a particular subspace, then the affines is defined by P1 plus U and P2 plus U turn out to be the exact same. That's what we have just proved a while back. Like whenever the difference between two vectors lies in the subspace, then by you know adding, like describing it as uh, V plus U and W plus U, you end up with the same identical affine set. That's what we just proved a while back. Those three equivalences you remember, one was V minus W belongs to U is the same as V plus U is equal to W plus U is the same as V plus U intersection W plus U being non-empty, right? So by, by virtue of those, we are claiming this, right? Okay. <clears throat> so at least we have clarified that addition and multiplication, scalar multiplication are well defined. You can go ahead and check that subject to these two operations that we have just described, performed on objects belonging to this, this is, it turns out to be a vector space. Remember, this is a non-obvious or non-trivial set of operations we have defined because these are operations on sets, affine sets, okay? This is imposed by definition. This algebraic structure that we are imposing is not something that comes naturally, but it's something we are doing for endowing it with a particular structure, right? Okay. So before we conclude today's lecture, we shall define another important object, which is the quotient map. All right. So the quotient map is going to be a map that's defined from a vector space that we are very familiar with, precisely V, to what we have now learned. Again, needless to say, U is a subspace of V. I'm not going ahead and defining that, right? So how is this quotient map defined? Uh, let me use a color. It basically takes objects such as V in this vector space V and maps it to an affine set.
Okay. Before we get deeper into this, what is the additive identity with respect to vector addition in the quotient space? Phi. Sorry? Phi. Phi. What is the additive identity? Sorry? U. U. Where do you say that? See, what do you need for the additive identity? Just think back on what is the additive identity. Whenever you add the additive identity, you must get back the same object. So if you take V plus U plus 0 plus U, don't you get V plus U back, right? So this qualifies that this is indeed additive identity in V quotiented by U, correct? It's very important to understand that this is the additive identity in this vector space, all right? Okay, now let us try and understand whatever we can, whatever insights we can glean from this quotient map. What is the image of this quotient map? Hmm? Which set? I mean, as in, does every object inside this have a pre image? It does, right? So, observations. I mean, I'm not even going to call them proofs because they're just, just that, just observations. The observation is that the image of this quotient map is nothing but <clears throat> this, right? It is true, isn't it? Because you see, it takes objects in vector space V and spits out affine sets. So if you are allowed to sweep over all possible Vs, you are basically covering all possible affine sets that are possible, all possible parallel translates of U, which is the entirety of nothing but this by definition itself, right? So therefore, this is indeed the case, okay? What about the kernel of pi? So when I'm talking about the kernel of pi, what am I asking for? I'm asking for that object inside V, which maps to the zero inside this. And the zero inside this, I already know is this, because this is equal to the zero inside the quotient space, correct? So I'm asking for that particular object inside V, yeah? Yeah, the entirety of U. If I pluck out vectors inside the subspace U, they are precisely all the fellows that get mapped to something plus U, but then that is this zero plus U. And that is the, nothing else, nothing else can map to the additive identity that is the zero of the quotient space, which is this. If you take anything outside U, it is a translate of U. It can never be equal to U because two affine sets are just either that, either parallel or they're the same. So the only fellow that's equal is if you, if you choose this V to belong, belong to U. So you restrict your choice of V to instead of belonging to anywhere in V to the subspace U of V, right? So this is U. And do you see where I'm going with this? All that I need to establish is that this fellow is linear and I'll be in a position to apply rank nullity theorem. Is this linear? Right? You take alpha v, maps it to alpha v plus u. Right? So the scaling holds, goes through. Right? If you take v1 plus v2, 
It's just V1 plus V2 here. I mean, the U doesn't get affected at all. So it is linear. Just, again, I'm going to leave that to you as an exercise to check. Check linearity. But that's a crucial detail because without that linearity, you cannot apply rank nullity. But having checked linearity, if you now apply rank nullity to this, what does it turn out to be? This is the domain. So dimension V is equal to dimension kernel pi plus dimension image pi. But then these we have already observed. So this is by rank nullity theorem. <coughs> this is nothing but dimension u plus dimension v quotiented by u, which if I now write down <coughs> here, dimension v quotiented by u is equal to dimension v minus dimension u. Exactly what we had tried to intuitively ascertain when we motivated discussions about this, right? Remember, three-dimensional Euclidean space, subspace being one-dimensional like a line. So therefore, yeah, what? The, the quotient being isomorphic to, yes, planes. When the subspace was a plane, the quotient was isomorphic to lines, right? So that is now established by virtue of this quotient map that we have defined and applied rank nullity theorem to get there, right? <coughs> so this is where we will stop today. In the next lecture, we will carry on a little forward with this and try to study what is known in the literature as the first isomorphism theorem. Another very interesting result that this quotient spaces and uh, these sort of constructions allow us to delve into. And then we shall move into inner product spaces. Thank you. Because we have everywhere we have invoked uh, rank nullity for that we needed linearity, right? Unless it's a linear map, we cannot talk about uh, this rank and nullity and all this. Sorry? If you have found the kernel and image, so if you have found the kernel and image, kernel and image, kernel and kernel and image. image yeah. But you cannot say that it's going to be equal to this, no. This relation is all subject to think of how we proceeded with the proof of rank nullity. At every step, we were using linearity. Right? We were allowing. At, at, the, at the heart of it was the existence of a linear map, which told us then that if you know what the linear map does to a basis, you know what it does to any vector. But unless you have that linearity, it may not be sufficient to just describe a map over a basis and say that I'm done. You might need to define it over other arbitrary points. So that is the niceness of linear maps, which allows us to extend and understand them and study them by just seeing their action on a basis.